coat hiking at night or early in the morning when it is dark and just get yourself okay with that stuff. Because when you're mule deer hunting, every, every hour needs to be dedicated to try and finding these things and killing these things. And you'll see in a couple other slides how hard they can be to actually find. So, you know, another thing too, to think about the longer you're out there. So if you're, if you're planning to be there for seven days or 10 days or five days, whatever, the longer you're out there, the more, the, the, the harder it is, is going to be, the harder it is, it's going to be for you to focus on staying out there and getting the job done. So after day, like you might be all good to go day one and two, and on day three, you've already walked 30 miles, you know, it's, 20 degrees in the morning, 80 degrees in the afternoon, you're sunburned, you're chafing or whatever it is. Oh, day three, oh, we're, we're just going to go back and stay at a hotel tonight because, you know, we need to take a shower and, you know, just, just relax. You know, that's, that is, that is wasting time that you can dedicate to hunting these things. And most of the people that I've taken out that haven't done this before, one of these mental games is what gets them out of killing something. So doing everything you can to focus and actually dedicate all the time available to pursuing this animal is at the end of the day, what's going to, what's going to get you, get you that kill on the ground. Any questions on this? And we could talk about things that I do. Um, you know, that like, like, for example, it was like two weeks ago, I was sitting out by the fire with my dogs and I started petting my dog and she was all wet. And then, then I realized it was like drizzling the entire time. Like it, it's to the point where it just, it, it won't even phase you that like different weather conditions, like you're going to be out there because you want to be out there and you want to hunt and that, that other stuff doesn't matter. So the next thing that you really need to be prepared for are your physical abilities. And I want to be perfectly clear. This has nothing to do with going to the gym and bodybuilding that social media is shoving down everybody's throats. It, from what I've seen, at least recently, like the, the bodybuilder physique is not ideal for the hunter or the, the focus on, you know, muscular sh strength, essentially. Um, it actually can hurt you. And I've seen it. I've got a, I've got a friend who he's, I mean, he spends a lot of time in the gym. He's got like no body fat whatsoever. You know, that this is, that's all he does. And at the end of each day, he is in so much more pain than I am from hiking around and, you know, being in uncomfortable positions because essentially what you're, you're, you're most likely always going to be in a calorie deficit. And if you don't have any fat for your body to use to make up for that deficit, it's going to go after your muscle. So when your body starts using your muscle for energy, it's going to cause more pain than if, you know, you had a layer of fat there for your body to use when you're in a calorie deficit. I'm not saying like being fat is the ideal condition, but you know, having, having fat on your body is actually a little more helpful than having no fat on your body, if that makes sense. So, I mean, for example, like my dad and two uncles that I go mule deer hunting with all the time, they, they get mule deer and they get big mule deer almost every single time we go. And they are way overweight. My dad's like, my dad's five, six, and he's like 280 pounds. And he, he hobbles himself out there and kills a mule deer and the reason being is you're you're not in any kind of race C crossfit makes no sense for this you just you need to have the ability to walk long miles with weight on your back and the occasional you know quick action movement if you need to get somewhere quick to make a shot so what i found that the best things to focus on are you know going so here here's what i do so and and 
I have more motivation to do this because I have bird dogs that if I don't take them out, they are super crazy and they'll destroy the house. And I don't want that. So I make a point to get them out nonstop, but I do three to five miles every day, either before work or after work and with, with the dogs. And I carry anywhere between 60 and 80 pounds on my back with my pack. Now you don't have to start that high. You can start lower, like 20 pounds. So I do that every other day. And the, the, the days that I'm not hiking with my pack, I'm doing some kind of cardio training. Like I'll, I'll go for mountain bike ride or something, or, um, I, I do those like insanity videos, the high intensity interval training type stuff, just to just get, get my cardio a little bit better. I just start incorporating that stuff. Question? I'm on this phone. All right. Anyways, so don't think that you have to go to the gym every single day and lift weights or anything like that. That's, that's not going to get you where you need to be. You need to focus because here's another thing too. Um, you know, when you're carrying weight on your back, you're, you're using and you're hiking, especially in rough terrain with, with rock, like rocky terrain or muddy terrain or snowy terrain, you're using muscles in your, in your legs that it's extremely hard to replicate in a gym in the first place. So you could, you could work out legs at the gym every single day. And after one day of backcountry hunting, you, you'll be sore as can be. So actually getting out there and doing the activities that are similar to what you're going to be doing when you're hunting are going to be the most helpful. So um, I also incorporate like shooting into this. You know, if you, if you have to run up a hill and then lay down and make a shot quick before the deer runs away, you know, you could replicate that. If you go to your, your local range, you know, you could, you could run to the hundred yard line and back and lay down and, and put a timer on. You have to shoot within five seconds or 10 seconds or something like that. Um, those are, those are different things I, I like to do as well, but the, don't get intimidated by the, the things you see on social media and all these people, like they're trying to be super fit to, to go out and try and kill a mule deer or an elk or something. You, it, it's not the fit being fit is important but it's not like you need to be a star athlete to be successful it goes back to your mindset um now now one thing i will caveat if you're not confident in your physical abilities if you're intimidated by you know different mountain ranges or you know how far back you have to go to find animals yeah you know, that goes back to your mental abilities you need to get yourself confident in your in your shape to be able to, um, you know, do those things. All right, we've got a question here. Do you think there's any value in the train to hunt things like that, maybe even as setting a baseline for your fitness? Yeah, so I've looked into some of that stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's that mountain tough fitness. Um, you know, they have different training programs. Built for the Hunt has different training programs. Uh, the, the train to hunt program does, you know, th there's nothing wrong with doing those, but um, I de and I definitely think that it's not going to hurt you. You know, it's definitely going to help you, but what, what all these training programs la lack in my opinion, whether they're in the gym or not in the gym. And I'm not, I'm not super familiar with train to train to hunt torn. So if, if there's things in this, in that, for that, then, but um hiking with a weighted pack it's it's very hard to replicate in in the gym or whatever so you know you have to set time aside to do that and it doesn't matter where you live on this earth there's definitely ways to do that i lived in houston texas for a year where it was super flat but i worked in a 72 story skyscraper so after work every day i would get my pack and walk the 72 floors up and down um, to, to try and maintain that aspect of it. So that's pretty much all I have on the physical abilities side of things. Any, any questions? All right. Just to butt in here real quick, Ryan, 
So yeah. if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand in the, the chat or just unmute yourself. I think I unmuted everybody and open forum, right, Brian? Yeah, yeah. You, if, if I'm saying something, stop me whenever. Um, we'll, just, we'll just have at it. Um, I can't see the raise your hand function anymore when I'm share because I'm sharing my screen. But uh, if if someone does raise their hand, Torn, stop me and and we'll 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 take care of the question. Hey Brian, is there any? Yeah. Helps with elevation or um, just going uphill, other than just going uphill. <laughs> Sorry, I, you you kind of cut out. A little bit. Can you repeat that? Is is there anything that you think helps with elevation, uh, or just climbing as many hills as you can back in back home? So you you cut out again. But are you are you talking about like uh, potential altitude sickness for for elevation? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. There. A mountain at 10,000 feet sucks really bad. <laughs> right, right. So the two main things that I can stress, I honestly, I haven't experienced mountain sickness, so it's hard for me to relate to it. But there's things that, you know, you can do to alleviate it. Number one is acclimation. So if it's any way possible, if you get above like, you know, six or 7,000 feet, you know, it, and you can stay at that elevation for like a day, that really helps your body get acclimated to the elevation. And it should help you as you climb higher and higher. But if you, if you do start getting and you start feeling those, drop a thousand feet and stay there. Um, that, that's my biggest advice. And then usually after that, if you, if you're feeling okay, you know, it, it should help you out quite a bit. The, the other thing too, is just it, going back to that physical fitness, the, the better your cardio is. So that's why I started incorporating more cardio into, you know, my daily routines, the better your cardio is, the better you're going to react to, um, the less oxygen in the air. That's how I feel. Number three, there's, uh, there's supplements out there. I, I don't know how well they work. I, I can't fully speak to them, but I know Mountain Ops has a supplement that helps reduce uh, symptoms of altitude sickness. But like I said, I, you know, I've taken them before, but I've never, I've never fully experienced mountain sickness. So I can't I can't speak to, you know, dealing with it while I'm on the mountain, if that makes sense. Another thing that's out there too, I see hikers, it's, it's pretty popular in the hiking world, is those, uh, those, those canned oxygen tubes. So if, you know, if you start experiencing that, you, it's just like an aerosol can that you can uh, spray into your mouth and it's like a high level percentage of oxygen and, and it helps you out but uh, I don't know how effective they are either. Do you mind if I chime in, chime in here real quick? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, one of the things that I had to do back in college uh, for that kind of training when I ran track was when we would have a meet somewhere in another state that was going to be at a higher elevation, our training changed to kind of like that high intensity training so you're already depleting the amount of oxygen that are in your that, that's in your red blood so changing your regime to a more high intensity instead of just doing your basic standard hiking increase it or maybe do like a couple wind sprints increase your uh your oxygen intake and then go on that hike can help alleviate that as well yeah, that's where that, that high intensity interval training really comes in handy. Um, and that's why I started, I started doing more of that stuff. Good, good ad. 
Yeah, and real quick too, not to sound simplistic about it, but uh, nose breathing versus mouth breathing. I know it's not always yeah. the easiest thing to do, but your saturation levels are different when you're yep. breathing through your nose. So that's a big deal. 100%. Thank you. That help you out, Justin? I'll take that as a yes. All right, so moving on to technical abilities, and this is this is really um, probably more so what you all wanted to talk about, but I, I felt that it was very important to go over these these other things as well. It, it they all come together, and they all are equally as important when you're going on hunting trips like this. So when I'm talking technical abilities, I'm not just talking about you know, understanding the the animal and different tactics to hunt mule deer. Um, the there's four main things that are really important that you need to research, study, understand, and practice before you go on a backcountry hunt. And the first one is first aid and trauma care, wilderness survival, land navigation without electronics and obviously your marksmanship skills. So if, if you're, so sitting here right now, how many people feel confident in their first aid abilities if something were to happen to them or one of their friends out in the field? Can you, can you put on a tourniquet? Can you, um, you know, alleviate a serious cut can if someone gets a stick in their eye do you know how to treat that if someone you know cuts their arm on their broadhead or if someone's bow falls apart if someone breaks their leg um, and you have to find a way to carry them out or you know fix the temporarily address the fracture you know can you handle all of those situations right now and that's that's something that's really important if you're going to go back five, six, seven plus miles and camp out for seven days with likely no cell service. You know, do you have the ability to take care of yourself and the people that you're with if something were to happen? And if if you can't if you can't confidently do that, if you don't know what to do, if someone gets severe poison ivy or if they you know, if they break their leg or any, any situation like that, and they're more common than you think, or if someone gets bit by a rattlesnake, you know, if you're not confident, you can handle that situation in the back country until, you know, a higher level medical personnel arrives or you can get them to them, then that's should be one of your top priorities uh, you know, in your learning process right now. And it goes, again, all these things are going to go right back to your mental abilities. If, if you go out seven miles and you, you're with you and two of your friends and none of you know how to treat a serious injury, if it were to happen, you know, that's going to drop your confidence level in staying out there longer and longer. Same thing with wilderness survival. There's a, there's a, a rule of threes that I, that I always talk about. And it's, there's three things that you need for your survival. And that's obviously shelter, water, and food in that order. And in, in a bad situation, you can survive three hours without shelter. You can survive three days without water and you can survive three months without food. And that's exactly how you should prioritize your efforts if you were to get lost or in a bad situation out in the backcountry. Your first objective is you need to find shelter. If it's snowing or if it's cold or, you know, if, if raining, whatever, three hours is, is, your, is your clock before you can get a serious condition or even die. Same thing with water. Your next step is to find water. And then your third step is finding food. So, you know, understanding that, understanding the different things, how to make 
fires, how to purify water, how to find things out in the areas that you're going to be hunting, understanding what's available to you as a resource outside of what's on your back is, is vital. And, you know, that's another thing that's going to prevent you from going farther and harder. If you're not confident in being able to camp out and stay out there, you know, as, as long as you plan to, or if, if, if something happens, if you get a hole in your tent, you know, what are you going to do about it? Or if, you know, your, you know, your water purifier breaks, what, what's going to happen then? So wilderness survival and first aid are two of the most important things. And, you know, it's, it's all fine and dandy to think beforehand that you're going to be okay in these situations until you get out there and the first thing goes wrong and you start to panic about it. That's a clear sign that you're not ready to be out there, you know, hunting for seven days, six, seven miles away from the nearest road with no cell service. So, you know, whether you think you're confident or not, you need to Everybody always needs to take a hard look at what their skill level is when it comes to this, because, you know, this is one of the top reasons how people don't come back, because they go out there and they think they know more than they actually do. They get themselves into trouble. They're not confident. They panic. And then it just keeps going downhill from there. Another thing everybody should be competent in and, you know, have in their back pocket is an understanding of land navigation and orienteering. You need to definitely understand how to figure out where you're at in an area and where you need to go if your GPS or phone dies or, you know, whatever it is, you should always have a map and compass and the ability to get back to where you need to get to without technology. I know it like you can have a backup to a backup to a backup, but there's always that chance of unfortunate events that leads you to needing a map and compass. Personally, I like using one better than a GPS anyways. I don't like to, re- I like to rely on technology the least amount as possible. So understanding navigation and, you know, if, if there's a, if there's a hard interest in anybody taking deeper dives into anything we talk about, you know, I could talk about, you know, specific things for like, and, you know, specific things that were, you know, I'm hitting this very high level. So we could get into some really good specifics. If you guys have an interest in learning about navigation, what you need to know within the first aid realm, what you need to know in the wilderness survival realm, all that stuff, you know, we can have, we can have additional webinars just on these things. Um, so the, the last thing is, is marksmanship and, you know, everybody likes to practice with their bow or their rifle at a flat range, um, you know, in in the wide open. So, um, oh, we have a question in the Q and A. Let me pull that up. I don't have a buddy's life at home, back country in the Virginia mountains and train most of the year for it, but I'm no super athlete. How would you change your strategy, the distance you hike in, the type of terrain you hunt if you're solo? I've no issues going deep and hunting deep, but on my own, rucking that deer out, I'm just sure how much strategy changed from solo hunting Wyoming, Montana. It, it's It's pretty similar. I mean, it, it also depends on the time of year too. So, you know, if, if you're out there in September by yourself and you're elk hunting and you know, it's going to take more than a day to pack out that elk to where you need to pack it out to that, that should definitely be a consideration on how far you go in solo. Another thing too, to think about is if you go out there solo, um, I've, I've, I haven't done this before, but I've considered it before. If you go out there solo, there's always, there's always guides or horse packers in the area. So doing some research before you go out there of different guides in the area and calling them up, most of them have horses and, you know, you could pay us much, you could pay a small fee. And if you kill one, 
you know, just send them the coordinates and they'll, they'll come with their pack mules and, and help you pack your animal out. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty common. And a lot of guides and outfitters will do that if they have the animals available. So that's one thing to consider if you want to go farther and deeper by yourself and are concerned about packing the animal out. But you're, you're definitely right. If, if you're, if you're going elk hunting or even mule deer are pretty heavy too, you know, and you're concerned about the meat, that's definitely a consideration. As far as the other things, it, it goes back to your confidence again on how comfortable you are being by yourself and your understanding of the wilderness survival and first aid aspects. If you're confident that you could live out there where no matter where it is by yourself for multiple days, then, you know, that just gives you the confidence to go farther and deeper if you need to. So hopefully that, hopefully that, that answers your question. Background in hunting terrain of the, of Nebraska for mule deer, archery hunt plan this fall spot in stock, baiting whether to go grassland, sand hills, or down uh, in the Frenchman unit by Kansas. Two guys to film the hunt, any suggestions where to go? So I actually, I haven't actually hunted Nebraska, but I've hunted similar open country terrain. And actually these, these two, uh, these two pictures are, are kind of more, they're not, they're not open country like you think Nebraska, but um, they are, uh, it, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, Torin and I were supposed to go there this year, weren't we Torin? But we, we got that canceled unfortunately. Um, but offline, I can show you the places that I was researching about going to Nebraska and maybe we could, we could set up a one-on-one -on -one or something to talk about, um, how I came to those conclusions. So, um, but in any event, um, when we talk about mule deer tactics, um, there's, there's two, terrains that I'm familiar hunting them in and that's open country and you know mountains with dark timber and aspens and and all that good stuff so this your your question Gabe was more about open country when I'm hunting open country it's a lot different than when I'm hunting more mountainous terrains this the type of areas where I hunt you never get that good vantage area where you could just glass for long periods so the the end game no matter where you're hunting mule deer or how you're hunting mule deer is covering acreage and that is one of two ways through through your eyes and through your feet so in areas where you can't get a good vantage point i am literally walking non-stop all day long with my binoculars looking out as far as i can for these mule deer. And I have two videos actually, and you've all been staring at them for a while, so you might have already found them, but I'll play the first one on the left first. So in the chat, can anybody tell me how many mule deer are in this left picture? And can you even see any? And this is this is the brilliance about mule deer is even in the most open country with no cover at all, they are very difficult to find. All right, nobody wants to guess. Torn said he's gonna potentially give something away for anybody who gets these right. Right, Torn? I got some free Onyx map hunt subscriptions if you get them oh, right. Okay, cool. All right, so on the left, we'll we'll do like ten more seconds to get your get your guesses in. All you have to you you could guess and get it right and get free Onyx. So, all right. Three on the left, one on the right. 
Ooh. The one on the right is a lot easier. All right, we're going to play the one on the left. Zoom in there, and you can see there's one, two, three, four, there's six all together. And so these mule deer, and, and I'm not taking this with like a, with the iPhone or anything. This was with my high res DSLR camera. And these, these mule deer were less than a hundred yards away. So you could see how easily they disappear. So on the right, let's, let's guess how many on the right. <laughs> Five for the right. This one's kind of tricky. So I'll zoom in here. And if you look, there are three. There's, there's three. Mom and two little ones. But Torn, I think, I think, I think one, whoever guessed one, that, that would be a pretty good, pretty close enough guess, right? Yeah. Because that, that was kind of tricky because the other two were, were hidden behind a little hill, hill there. So one thing about mule deer is when they're in the right situations, they're, they're very difficult to see. So having a good pair of binoculars and a good spotting scope is one of the key things that I use when hunting them, whether it's open country or mountainous terrain. You know, when I'm up in the mountains, usually I find a good vantage point where I could glass a lot of a lot of acreage and I'll sit there and break down every little area and you're looking for you're looking for ear twitches. I mean, they hide themselves really good. You're looking for ear twitches, tail flickers you're looking, you're never looking for the whole mule deer, even in the open country though, you could see the, you can see this sagebrush and they're almost the same color as this sagebrush right here. They'll, they'll bed down on a hillside in the shade behind this sagebrush. And you could, you know, you could spend all day staring at them and you'll never actually see them until they move their head or something. So, um, you know, having good glass and, you know, practicing your ability of using it is important. It's not, it's not just having good glass. Okay. It's, it's, it's practicing with it. Like take them out and try and find things in your daily life that are hard to find. You know, if you're going out hiking, just, I always have my binoculars with me and I'm always looking for things because you have to get your, yourself adjusted to, to looking for these meticulous things. And and I'll be honest, the, the first finding the first one is the hardest. And then as you as you find more, it gets easier and easier because you know what you're looking for. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Torn had a question. Do you always take a scope and what size optics? OK, no, I don't always take a spotting scope. It depends where I'm where I'm going. This this type of open country, I, I usually don't take one because I don't. I can't, I can never see far enough for it to be valuable. Um, but in mountainous terrain, yeah, definitely take one because it, you're, you're really trying to fine tune every little piece that you could see. Um, 10 by 42 for my binoculars. That's, I mean, that's a lot of people. That's their, that's their standard optic. Um, the 12 powers are getting a lot more popular as well um, for Western hunting. My cousin uses 12s and he really likes them. Uh, but 10 by 42 is, if, if you want a one size fits all binocular, sa save up and just get one really good pair of 10 by 42s or take Eric's advice and rent them, which that's super cool that I didn't know about. Spotting scope, um, I have a Swarovski 20 to 60 power, uh, the, the smaller one the 60 millimeter lens, I think they got a 60 and 80. 
or 65 and 80, 65 and 80. I have the 65. Uh, I picked the 65 over the 80 because I wanted something smaller and compact to fit in my pack. Um, and uh, what I I used to have a Vortex Razor 85 millimeter, and what I found is that I get the same uh, I get the same light and a little bit better resolution through the smaller Swarovski than the than the Vortex, and the Vortex was like twice the weight. So that's why I switched over to that, and you know I I can find things pretty good with that with that uh, 65 millimeter, 20 to 60 power. Um, so any questions on this stuff? Cool. Um, so the the last thing uh, we got, we got some time left here. Uh, I won't get into this too much. This could be topics for a future presentation if, if you guys are interested, but some of the other important things, especially if you're an out of stater or traveling a great distance like I have to, is trip planning and travel details. A lot of people get intimidated by that, and that's a big reason why a lot of people don't ever go on hunts like this, but it, it's actually pretty simple. Understanding the gear that you need. If, if anybody on here wants a gear list, I could send you a gear list. Um, to get yourself started but understanding the gear you need versus the gear you want is a big deal um there are some things that i don't that i that are nice to haves not need to haves that i don't ever give up like my like my favorite chair torn um but uh overall understanding what you need to have versus what you want to have is a big deal uh food and water what are you going to eat how much does that food weigh and how much of it do you have to bring in with you water is is there a good water source where you're camping a lot of the places where i hunt mule deer water is very sparse so it's either carry all your water in or find the random nasty cow troughs that are all around the public lands and have to deal with that um you know, different gutting methods. I know this was more of a mule deer focused event, but the bigger the animal, you know, there's different ways to, there's a gutless method to quarter skin and quarter animals out. Um, so knowing those, um, and I, so I put this in here. I thought, I always thought gutting was like common sense, but um, my buddy has a butcher shop and they do deer processing every year in Pennsylvania. And I was shocked when he told me that half the people that come into the butcher shop bring their whole deer that's not even gutted because they don't know how to gut it. So they have the butcher shop do everything for them. So I was pretty surprised by that, but um, definitely, definitely knowing that is important when you're backcountry hunting also knowing how to properly skin quarter and even debone an animal and how to care for the meat once the animal is dead and how you're going to get it back to your truck or exit location as well as how you're going to get it back home if you have to travel a far away so uh since we're close to time here i won't get into details on this if you have questions about it then uh um you know let definitely ask them webinar on e-scouting and understanding types oh yeah yeah okay perfect so that's a that's a good question and you know we could definitely pull up onyx and go through an e-scouting session i think i think that would be great so in open country it's very hard in my experience to dial down key areas where mule deer are they seem to just they can be anywhere at any time so it goes back to just covering covering acreage or mileage as much as you can one thing i will say in open country if you can find shade and places to, for them to hide that's more likely where they're going to be so don't 
don't be don't be wasting your time looking at you know super sunny areas that are exposed look for those little crevices of shade where they could be hidden and tucked away back in there yes yeah the other important stuff that that's why that's why i put it in here because this could be like webinar 2.0 um to to talk about these more detailed things so um yeah very important flying or driving i do both and it really depends on the trip um i've been successful doing both i mean my family we drive out there and driving honestly makes it really easy from a, a meat care stat standpoint we take we take two big chest freezers in the back of the truck and drive out there and um, we put all of our meat in these, you know, big chest freezers with a generator and then pretty much the meat gets frozen. If we stay at a hotel overnight, the ho all the all the hotels have power outlets outside. So we have an extension cords for the for the freezers and we just plug them in while we sleep overnight. And usually when we get back, I have to spend a day with the meat out in the sun thawing because it's still frozen when we get back so driving is definitely the easiest there's been multiple ways i've done it flying um i am lucky when i hunt colorado my cousin lives there so if i kill something there he just drives it back with him when he comes home for christmas so i'm lucky there but you know shipping your meat versus um you know taking it on the plane it, it just it's a cost perspective um one thing that i've done in the past is i put all my clothes in a big cooler and i've flown to the location hunted and because of pricing i would ship all my clothes and gear back like ups or postal service or something and i would put all the meat in the in the cooler um I would stay at a hotel overnight. Some of the hotels have freezers and they'll like the, the mountain towns and hunting towns, like they'll, they'll let you um, put your meat in the freezer overnight. So I'll do that. And then I'll, uh, I'll fly back with the cooler and the meat and then all my gear and clothes will ship back like a couple of days later. Um, all right. Couple other questions. In early season, how long are you seeing deer on their feet versus bedded? And in your past successes, what is the ratio of ambush versus spot and stock? Good question. So um, in the early season, it's, it's usually once the sun comes up, they're bedding down. And once the sun goes down, they're, they're coming out to, to feed again. My hunting experience with mule deer on spot and stock versus ambush is mostly I so I've I've killed I've killed two I wouldn't say by ambush but I was walking and I jumped them and I saw they were big bucks so I shot them but so I had I wasn't necessarily stocking them but uh they just they caught me off guard I saw they were bucks and I shot them the other ones, they've all been spot and stock where, you know, I'm slowly walking around or I glass and, and I see them and I sneak up and shoot or, you know, I, I find them from far away bedded down and I sneak up and, and shoot them. All right. If I had a rifle tag mid-September that was good in the mountains and open country, mountains or open country. So, um, Justin, that's a good question. And it, it depends where I think you're thinking of because Torn kind of briefed me on it. So there are migratory mule deer. So mule deer that live close to the mountains will spend the summer months up in the mountains. And then when winter hits, they will come down into the open country and live in the open country. So if you're and and Wyoming has one of those big migratory patterns for mule deer like that. So if it's a, if you're hunting in September 
I would venture to say you're more likely to see mule deer up in the mountains versus in the open country. Now, there are some that live in the mountains all the time and some that live down in the open country all the time. But those those mule deer that live live in the mountains typically migrate down into the open country. Um, but that that doesn't happen till like October, November. So if you're hunting September, um, you know, that's, that's where I'd be hunting. I'd be, I'd be up in the mountains and I'd, I'd have my spotting scope and I'd have my glass and my, uh, my binoculars. I'd be finding those good vantage points and, and covering, covering the amount of, uh, the most amount of miles I can looking for them. Can you talk about spot and stock tactics using terrain and thermals? For sure. Thermals are huge and so thermals are one of the biggest things you're going to encounter um if you if you live in a f more flat area or less mountainous area um and you don't understand thermals that's one of the other big things that you're going to need to understand before you go out there i can't i have a video of it and i wanted to include it in this webinar but i could not find it um quick enough but i have a video of I was sitting on this mountainside and I was watching probably four different groups of mule deer. They were all, they were all does. I think there was a couple little bucks in there. Um, but, uh, it would been, it would have been hard to get down to them because of all the does that were there. And I watched this guy get up and start walking with the wind across this mountainside. And I kid you not, it, the, the mule deer were probably a good half a mile away from this guy when they scented him and got up and ran. They never saw him and they, you know, they were really far away from him from my point of view, but they smelled him instantly because he was walking with the wind and took off and i watched the whole thing from another mountainside and that guy walked that whole mountainside and never even knew those mule deer were there so understanding thermals um always always walking upwind um is is going to be key when you're starting to put on a stock so the one of the first things i do and if you're hunting wyoming it's going to be really tricky because the one thing about Wyoming is that you're not, no one is allowed to kill does on public lands. So there are tons of mule deer does all over Wyoming. And when you finally spot a buck that you're going to, that you want to go after, you need to sit there and find every other doe from you to that buck, because those you'll, you'll spook doe that you never even knew were there and it's going to eventually spook that buck. So that's one of the interesting challenges with Wyoming specifically. Um, so understanding your path, what the wind direction is and how you're going to get there, what looking at the terrain and what leaves you open and vulnerable versus, you know, how you can sneak up there without that mule deer ever seeing you. So, you know, for example, when you, when you spot the mule deer and you begin your journey over to that mule deer to, um, to try and shoot it, that mule deer should essentially disappear from your sight until you get to the point that you want to get to, to try and make a shot or try and find him again. Because at any point where you could see the mule deer, it can see you. So um finding those little nooks and crannies to walk yourself through to make sure that mule deer doesn't see you while also making sure you never get upwind of him are the two biggest things when you're about to put on that stock all right any other questions i think i only half answered one of the other questions Let me look back. No, I think I, I think I got it all. Yeah, anytime, man. And if, if, if any of you have additional questions, definitely feel free to reach out.
if you want to have more in-depth conversations on anything, things you're curious about, um, things that you think you need to work on, um, any step, I could help you out with step-by-step -step plans um, to get you there. And uh, if, if there's an interest in um, the other important stuff and getting detailed on that, you know, we could definitely have a follow-up webinar. All right, another question. Thought about that tactic about staying out of sight from mule deer. Jared from Whitetail Drain always preaches to never lose a visual because on your time stalking the deer can move. So yeah, I I I disagree with never lose a visual. So you know the deer moving or disappearing, you know that that happens. Um, but what the most important thing is rather than rather than losing the visual on the deer is finding concrete landmarks around where the deer is bedded or where it is and um and using that to refine the animal once you get to your the the next location so a lot of times when people go on a stock they get excited and rush it and they get close and then they can't find the thing. Um, so um, that's a big issue because they don't have those landmarks. Another thing too is you can almost predict where the thing's going to like remember which direction that the deer is facing when you leave it. So if it does happen to get up, sometimes they just get up and sh like, basically stretch they'll walk like 20 yards and then bed back down so if they're likely going to move in the direction that they're facing or they might move up or down so it's it's not it's not a terrible thing if they if you get to your next spot and they're not in the same exact location spend about 15 20 minutes to refine it it you know that's that's happened to me before i would I would rather that mule deer have no chance of seeing me as I get to the spot I want to get to rather than, and then having to refine him or potentially losing him and finding him the next day, then, you know, keeping that visual and him having a higher chance of seeing me because then he's going to spook and he's going to be gone. Spotting partner to flag you in is always a good idea if you have a partner to flag you in. Um, now you do have to watch the legalities of that. Um, if you're texting, if you're doing it through texting or through radio or, you know, anything like that, it's uh, it's illegal in some states. So some people use like hand signals or different color flags to signal, you know, if the deer has moved, if you're close or anything like that. So um, using a partner to flag you in is is valuable, but you really have to watch how you go about doing it because it's it's illegal to use certain technologies in some states how often are you seeing deer get up and rebed based on shade changing the the deer don't want to be out in the sun so if they a lot of times they know the areas to bed down that they're not gonna you know have to move that much um they know those little nooks and crannies and and shady areas but a deer, if a deer finds itself in the sun, it's likely not going to stay there long. As for, as for how often I see them get up and rebed, I mean, it, I, I don't have a concrete number on that. Um, it happens, you know, I've seen deer get up. Some of them even, some of them get up at like, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon and, and feed a little bit. And then, uh, and then they go back. Oh yeah, north facing slopes. North north facing slopes, you know, you could cut what you're looking at um not completely in half, but by focusing on those north facing slopes where the sun is going to hit the least is uh is definitely a good idea. But shade in general as well. You'll see you'll see in Wyoming if you if you get into that open country, you know, how the, the how the terrain is it's just it's it's like it's like if you take your hand and you know there's all these different fingers and like that's how the elevation looks like your hand like this so 
it, it doesn't have to be a north facing slope. They'll, the mule deer will tuck themselves in right here, like below where my knuckles are, and they'll be shaded all day pretty much, no matter what direction they're facing. And they're, it's really easy for them to hide like in these areas of the fingers. Any other questions? All right, guys. Well, I want to thank you for your time and, and listening to me. Um, like I said, reach out if you have any questions at all. I'd be happy to answer them or help you out or go in depth with anything that you guys need to work on or, you know, want more information about. I know I know this was I know this was pretty high level um, and we didn't get into too many super detailed things, but you know, focus on those three things first and get yourselves really good um, in, in all of those aspects around, you know, really understanding where your weaknesses are mentally, physically, and technically. And that's going to help you be successful on killing a mule deer more than any other aspect of it. You know, the first three times that I went mule deer hunting, um, you know, I didn't know, I, I really didn't know anything about tactics or spot and stock tactics or, or anything like that in, in great detail. Even when I was 12 years old, I was given a map and compass and my, my rifle and we went out and I covered miles and never gave up and hunted every possible minute. And I always ended up finding a mule deer and being able to shoot it. So if, if, I, if you guys can take away anything, um, you know, really focus on those three things, being confident. And, you know, it's easy to say that you can be out there and stay out there until you're actually in it, especially if something goes wrong or if you get nervous about something. It happens to everybody. Um, but, you know really digging deep in those three things will help, will help you be successful. And I will definitely, you know, I will definitely send you that gear list, Kyle. Um, if you want to shoot me any, I'll put my email in the, the messages here. And then reach me there and then Facebook there you go that's that's all my contact stuff so reach out with anything Kyle if you want to shoot me an email or message or whatever I'll, I'll send that gear list to you no problem um, or if if you guys are server side members um, hit me up on the through server side as well so uh, I always send out a follow-up email after webinars just to see how we can improve that kind of stuff. I'll make sure that I attach all Brian's contact information in that as well. Um, that usually, it'll probably come out tomorrow or the next day. Uh, if you guys have any follow-up questions that you would like answered or one-on-one -on -one time, we're here to help. We want to make you more successful. That's our main goal. So 100%. with that being said, uh, if you're not a service side member, we offer a membership. It's a $40 a year registration fee. You get this kind of stuff uh, more regularly and partnership discounts, the whole community, the whole deal. So just want to throw that little plug in for our, our hunt club and our community. If you guys are interested in that as well, Brian, I'd really appreciate you putting this on. You shared years worth of knowledge that you've built over the years. Yep. And I really appreciate everybody hopping on, um, willing to take their time out of their data to learn to learn these tactics on on hunting mule deer. For sure. And oh, and my background, yeah, that that's those are the kind of fingers that I was that I was talking about. Um, so, like, they'll. I wonder if my mouse 
Can you see my mouse through this? Oh no, I I stopped sharing my screen. Never mind. So if you if you look, uh, let's see, see these. Oh, it's messing up. But you can see those like dark shaded crevices. I mean that that's that's where they're going to be hiding out. They're going to bed down down in there and hide out, and and they're really hard to find. So, but yeah. Appreciate all your questions. They were all really good, and uh, look forward to talking to you guys again. And we'll put we'll put something on here in the future uh, before the season gets kicking off on either e scouting or potentially land nav. We'll have we'll probably we'll have much more coming down the pipes. Um, I'm going out to Brian's. We're going to do a whole module on uh, shooting long distance shooting the whole deal. So keep eyes out for that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, definitely e-scouting and definitely we could do another one on the, the other important stuff slide that I showed because that, that's, that's important stuff too. For sure. All right. Thanks again, fellas.